Hello everyone! Recently, while filming a different video, my movie review of 1971's The Andromeda Strain, I pulled my copy of Jurassic Park off the shelf and felt a strong inclination to read it again. So I did! Here's a review of it. Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton, published in 1990, is a science fiction, action-adventure, horror thriller in which a corporation called InGen has discovered how to obtain dinosaur DNA and clone it. They're keeping these formerly extinct animals on an exclusive resort island off of Costa Rica where people will be able to come and marvel at them. But Jurassic Park has been encountering problems, and when a group of consultants is brought in for the weekend to help smooth out the snags, the whole system breaks down and the dinosaurs run amok. I dare say for most of you that summary was totally unnecessary. If you've never read the book, you've probably seen the 1993 Steven Spielberg movie and or one of its sequels, and if you haven't seen it, you're probably at least familiar with the concept. But just in case you aren't, that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, dinosaurs brought back to life and everything going horribly wrong. And just a quick note in case anyone's confused, yes, this is a re-review. Some of you have been around long enough or have gone deep enough in my backlog of videos to know that I talked about Jurassic Park in 2015. Um, but as reviews go, it's not very good. Um, besides the fact that I'm wearing a silly outfit, uh, a whole year had passed since I had read the book, and that's not good for doing a book review. And I tried to cover the book and the film without being specific about either, and the result was just disappointing. That's why I wanted to do a new review. Now I am going to talk about both the book and the film. I'm going to do some comparing. It's unavoidable. Um, but I'm I'm going to be more specific, but I'm going to be light-handed with spoilers, which is a tricky road to navigate. Um, I'm going to do it that way because I, if anybody has not read the book and they decide that they want to based on this review, a lot of the fun of reading it is all of the things that are unexpected, so I don't want to just spill the beans. Um, but I'm going to do my best to still be specific in pointing out differences and similarities, and uh, hopefully the end result is a better book review than I gave seven years ago. I love Jurassic Park. The movie is a longtime favorite, going back to when I was a little kid and it scared the heck out of me, but I loved it anyway. When I read the book in 2014, I loved that too, and after reading it a second time, I still think it's great. It's fast-paced, it's suspenseful, there's always something happening, the main idea and the moral debate is fascinating to me, and it's creepy! <laughs> it starts off with a quotation about why we fear snakes. I hate snakes, so this was just like, mm, yeah, we're just going right in there. If you only know the movie, then the entire first section is kind of shocking. It's all material that was left out of the film about cases in Costa Rica of strange lizard sightings, children being bitten, and infants being stolen from their cribs. Um, it is no surprise to me at all that they left all this stuff out of the movie, not just for the sake of time, but because I don't think you could show these things happening. <laughs> I don't think they could get away with, with showing, especially the scene with the baby. It's The way the investigation unfolds is incredibly frustrating due to human error, negligence, faulty assumptions, dismissal of evidence, and cover-ups. Um, I particularly love this setup and its pervasive, foreboding tone. It's creepy and vivid and a little gross, and it's a generous foretaste of what's to come once we meet our main characters and head to Isla Nublar where the bulk of the action occurs. The book has a lot in common with the film, plot, characters, themes, but wow, does it have a lot of different and new things, and to my way of thinking, that's a plus. You may know the film like the back of your hand, but the book 
will still surprise you. Events are so different that a separate movie can play out in your mind, independent of the one that already exists, and that makes it a lot of fun. You may have some trouble um, visualizing the characters as Crichton describes them, and not just visualizing the actors from the movie, but I don't think that's such a... that's not such an issue, and also you're visualizing these characters going through things that they never went through in the movie. Both times I read it, I found it made no difference at all that I already knew the story. I was jittery with nervous anticipation through the whole thing. It may have helped this time that I ended up reading a good deal of it uh, late at night, in bed, in the dark. Um, that certainly helps boost the fear factor. Um, I even had a dinosaur dream, which hasn't happened in years. To tell you the truth, I've always been scared of dinosaurs. Um, I know that might sound kind of ridiculous given all the Godzilla reviews I've done, and he's kind of a dinosaur, depending on who you ask. But when I was little, I would scream my head off and run away from dinosaur pictures and toys. Um, my family still makes fun of me for it sometimes. And even now, if I'm looking at a website or watching a video or flipping through a magazine, which never happens, <laughs> and an especially ferocious looking dinosaur pops up, I... <laughs> I still will jump and kind of cover it or try to get away as quickly as possible because um, my reaction is still Ooh, scary. Uh, so if this book is meant to be frightening, and I believe it is, I am like a prime target. I am more susceptible than your average adult, and I find it extremely effective. It also helps that Crichton's mode of storytelling here makes it all so convincing. The introduction is like the preamble to a scientific treatise. He blends facts and fiction so seamlessly that you aren't sure which is which. It sounds like well-researched data. But it's gripping and ominous, too. Um, I love how the first few dozen pages are basically saying something bad is coming, something bad is coming, something bad is coming! It's just delicious. Several of Crichton's most successful works handle similar themes that are explored here. The inevitability of an automated system failure, the consequences of hubris and man playing god, the danger of messing around with DNA, um, a succession of minor unchecked errors leading to a major catastrophe. Some people may criticize him, and they have, for writing about these topics so frequently, um, and essentially just doing the same thing but in different settings, but uh, I don't have an issue with it because I like those themes in science fiction. If I were ever inclined to write science fiction myself, which isn't likely, I would possibly do something along those lines too. Either that or a small-scale alien invasion story or something where machines become sentient and turn evil. You know, <laughs> something really original like that. You could boil it all down to the statement, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, which is a paraphrase of one of the standout lines from the movie, uh, spoken by Jeff Goldblum as Dr. Ian Malcolm. Malcolm's not a main character, and he's a passive player, but he's key because Crichton uses him as a mouthpiece to get his bigger points across. Malcolm is a mathematician who specializes in chaos theory, and from the get-go, he warns that the park is going to fail. The book is split into sections called iterations, each one opening with a simple graphic that changes, that advances in stages, with an accompanying quote from Malcolm explaining each phase of chaos theory, which is reflected in what's going on at the park. I don't subscribe to chaos theory myself, but I do find his arguments compelling, and I agree with a lot of his 
observations. I agree with the theory to the extent that no complex system, especially a living one, is ever entirely predictable, and we should not put all of our trust in a complex system or in an automated system. Um, I look at it from a Christian worldview, not as a result of mathematical calculations, but it's the same conclusion. Malcolm does do a fair share of enigmatic bloviating, and it's a little crazy when there's all this stuff happening, um, raptors are running around and they're killing people, and we suddenly stomp on the brakes to have three pages of a Malcolm monologue, uh, especially when he's mortally wounded and he's fighting for every breath. But he finds the strength to just go on and on and make these speeches. <laughs> but when he does get to his point, it's usually important. He makes some scathing comments about scientific arrogance and greed and the consequences of men piggybacking off of someone else's discoveries. Um, there's nothing earned, so there's no discipline, no wisdom, no standards, just a hunger for profit and prestige. Ian Malcolm is pretty similar to how he is in the film, but not as funny, not as cool, not Jeff Goldblum. Dr. Alan Grant, the main protagonist, is an expert here specifically on dinosaur young, family communities, and nesting habits. There are two striking differences with his character. In the book, he wears a beard and a Hawaiian shirt, which is just funny to picture. It's so different from what I usually visualize that character wearing. And he loves kids. That's a big change. Grant in the film is kind of grumpy and hates kids. He has no idea how to talk to them or relate to them. And so when he's confronted with two over-eager specimens, he does everything he can to avoid them. But they end up in this crazy situation together and he has to rescue them and traverse the whole island with them and his feelings change. It's a great arc for the character and a sweet, heartwarming element in an otherwise scary, stressful film. There's none of that in the book. Not that they don't have some nice moments together, but it's not going for a warm, fuzzy feeling, and um, it's, the situation just is completely different. Um, it's actually somewhat reversed. Tim is reserved and embarrassed when he meets Grant, who's kind of like a hero to him, as is the case in the film. But it's Grant who pursues him in conversation. Overall, the kids are quite different in the book. It's Tim, age 11, who's the older one, and his sister Lex is seven or eight and obsessed with baseball. Tim is kind of a lonely boy whose passion for dinosaurs is dismissed by his father, who thinks dinosaurs are just for little kids. His parents, their parents, are going through a divorce, their mom has a boyfriend, and it's an uncomfortable situation at home, at least for Tim. Um, Lex doesn't seem to be too bothered by it. But he's pretty bright, and he flourishes during this ordeal, um, his knowledge about dinosaurs and his instincts coming in handy. Lex, on the other hand, ugh, <laughs> she's a brat. She's a very annoying little sister type. She complains all the time about being hungry and bored. She thinks the dinosaurs are stupid. She grabs any opportunity she can to make fun of Tim. Um, I just, ugh. I found myself, and this is terrible, but I found myself wishing that she would be so traumatized that she'd stop speaking. But no, she's irritatingly resilient, with no healthy respect for the power and unpredictability of these animals. She's kind of like her grandfather in that respect. John Hammond, the uber-rich guy who's behind this whole thing, is characterized very differently in the book. In the movie, he's like a kooky grandpa with a mischievous twinkle in his eye. Maybe a bit shifty, a little braggadocious, but he means well enough, and he learns his lesson in the end. John Hammond in the book is a monster. A repugnant, impish old man who combines his 
childlike fascination with dinosaurs with an insatiable appetite for money. Um, he claims to have altruistic motives, but he is an egotist and a liar. Um, he brings people to his resort under false pretenses, goes out of his way to downplay and dismiss any flaws, endangers his own grandchildren, and then is less concerned about their safety than that of his expensive attractions. He's also a moron when it comes to the dinosaurs. He thinks they're trainable and every issue has an easy solution. He ignores red flags and he's tired of hearing about how dangerous the velociraptors are. He constantly gripes that everyone's being too critical and they're not in awe of what he's accomplished. I'm not sure what his worst trait is, but he's an infuriating man, and what happens to him is therefore, oh, extremely satisfying, a fine example of poetic justice. Most characters differ from how they're portrayed in the movie, where everyone's a little more fun, a little more dynamic, um, everything's just a little more lighthearted, despite the tension. The scene between Dennis Nedry and Dodgson, for example, has a totally different vibe. There are other characters in the film, though, who kind of disappear. Um, they serve their purpose in one scene and then whoosh, they're gone. Uh, like Dr. Harding, the vet, and Dr. Wu. Um, they have much more substantial roles in the book. They're still just supporting players, but they're in it a lot more. I'd say the one who gets the worst deal in the adaptation is Gennaro, the lawyer. In the book, he has an increasingly hostile relationship with Hammond and is determined to shut down the park if there's any danger. In the movie, Gennaro is a slimy, chicken-hearted stereotype, nervous about the project, but sufficiently distracted by dollar signs to go along with it. Um, the film actually combines Gennaro and another character um, who I don't believe is in the film, Ed Regis, uh, the bitter, overworked head of PR, uh, he's the one who runs away when the T-Rex comes out. I think it's curious that the movie chose to kill Gennaro off so early and do so in a way that's borderline comedic. Um, was it because he's a blood-sucking lawyer and universally we dislike them? So in the midst of all of this tension and even though it's a scary scene and it's disturbing and all of that, there's still a little sliver of us that's pleased. <laughs> Gennaro gets to live in the book, stands up to Hammond, and reluctantly agrees to go with Muldoon on dangerous missions. He's not trained or equipped for that kind of thing, and he's not brave, but he sucks it up because he knows any help he can give is needed. That's a lot different from the guy who abandons the kids, runs away, and gets eaten off the toilet. Michael Crichton co-wrote the screenplay with David Kep, so he knew about these changes and may have even implemented some of them himself. Changes would be necessary to reduce the dialogue, reduce the number of characters and dinosaurs and action sequences. Perhaps some of my viewers know more about his specific contributions to the screenplay and the motivations behind them. Like the movie, the book includes a lot of computer activity. Certainly those parts are dated now, um, and the further we get from that technology, the less accessible it is for the reader. Um, but I absolutely do not advocate for updating it or changing it or revising it or anything for the modern audience. I think that's a ridiculous idea. I did find it really interesting the first time I read it. The second time, not so much, <laughs> but I still thrill over those dinosaur tally charts when the expected number of animals is adjusted and the computer counts them and shows that there are more dinosaurs than there should be. There's one more of these, two more of those, uh, this species has doubled, the number of velociraptors has gone from 8 to 37? What? <laughs> yeah, uh, in the movie there are, what, five, six raptors? Uh, maybe even fewer than that. The book has many, many more. 
Among the standout moments are ones that were included in the movie. The Tyrannosaur attack on the kids in the Jeep, which is absolutely terrifying, and the kids walking alone through the dark cafeteria to the kitchen, unaware of the raptor hunting them. In the movie, it's two raptors, um, but it's also much better lit. <laughs> but there's a cornucopia of other awesome stuff not included in the film, like the early attempted raptor attack, the scary trip through the unfinished aviary, the raft and the waterfall, and the tyrannosaur, the cute moment with the baby triceratops and its mother, and the quick mention it's almost a throwaway of these dragonflies with six-foot wingspans um, and everything that happens at Safari Lodge. Specifically, though, the unforgettable image of characters staring helplessly up at the pyramidal skylight in the room um, with metal bars over it to keep the dinosaurs out, but because there's no power, uh, the raptors are just chewing on them, and any minute they'll break through. Ugh, it's so intense. And there are other prominent changes. The visitors do see dinosaurs on their tour, and the T-Rex does come out to eat the goat, to everyone's fascinated horror. Um, they encounter a sick Stegosaurus, not a Triceratops, and while Doctors Harding and Sattler are diagnosing it, Grant discovers a fragment of Velociraptor eggshell, and that's how he learns that the animals have been breeding. In the film, that reveal comes much later, and it's kind of downplayed, whereas here, it's a big deal. We've got dinosaurs sneaking in and out of their enclosures, showing up where they're not supposed to be, and they've been multiplying, and we have no idea how many there are or where they are. Ugh. There's also the added tension of a countdown. From a distance, some dinosaurs, raptors, of course they're raptors, it's always raptors, uh, are spotted on a supply ship that's headed back to mainland Costa Rica. Only Grant and the kids see this, and they have only so many hours to get the boat to turn back before it reaches its destination and the raptors are just free to go wherever they please. Um, so not only are they trying to not die, <laughs> they have to stop that boat! There's also a final quest in the book that was cut from the film, and an epilogue, and an eerie ending. And did I mention that the book is more violent and more graphic? For example, the scene with Dennis Nedry and the Dilophosaurus is much darker. It's a disturbing scene in the movie, don't get me wrong, but in the book it's even more... <sighs> Nedry's irritable and stressed, and then he gets lost, and then he turns back to the car and he sees just beyond the headlights this ten-foot-tall dinosaur watching him, and uh, there's nothing cutesy about it, there's no disarming goofiness, he doesn't try to talk to it, um, and then there's the terror of sudden burning pain, and then total blindness, and then it's followed by the horrific realization that the dinosaur has slashed at his torso and he's holding his own guts in his hands. <laughs> yeah, Spielberg definitely PG-13 that. A good deal of the maulings and deaths in the film are actually implied. You don't see as much as you might think you do. The power of suggestion is strong, and I for one find it perfectly effective as it is, but I'm not at all surprised that people who read the book first were disappointed with the film for toning things down and making it more family-friendly. Is Jurassic Park a kid's movie? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, there's definitely some stuff in there that uh, I wouldn't show a little kid. I think maybe some parents were guilty of thinking along the same lines as Tim's father, that 
Oh, it's dinosaurs. It's for kids. My parents were under no such delusions. The reason I saw it so young was because I had older siblings um, who wanted to see the movie, and so when it came out on VHS, my mom bought it, and they all watched it, and uh, I was there. What were they going to do? Lock me up to just be by myself, getting into trouble, you know, shaking baby powder out onto the floor. That happened. Um, I, uh, so yeah, I saw Jurassic Park far too young, <laughs> but I don't think I was really traumatized by it. Maybe that's why every time I saw a picture of a dinosaur I ran away screaming. Um, but, um, what was my point here? Anyway, uh, I don't think that Jurassic Park is a kids movie, but they did tone down some of the graphic violence and gore um, to reach a more general audience. And it's because of that and all the material that was cut to fit the story into two hours that I can see the potential for a new adaptation of the book, one that's rated for mature audiences and shows the gore, and perhaps you could make it a miniseries so they can fit everything in, and that would also help make it clear to any uh, naysayers out there that this is not a remake of Jurassic Park, it's another adaptation of the book. That said, I don't feel any strong desire for a new version. I love the old one, and I don't know that I would like a new one. I wouldn't want it to be too gory, and I wouldn't want them to add a whole bunch of nonsense, like relationship drama or anything like that. And the budget would have to be so big that I don't know how they could manage to get it all done and done well. Um, it would have to be a huge production, but it's interesting to think about. Anyway, to sum this all up, I love the book. I think it's great. Um, I think I loved it a little bit more the first time around when it had the element of surprise and I was just blown away by all the stuff I wasn't expecting, but second time around, still loved it. It's intense, exciting, exhilarating, clever, and thought-provoking. Um, scary. <laughs> uh, it's a bold, ingenious concept, brilliantly executed. And those are my thoughts on Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton. I hope you enjoyed this review. Let me know if you've read it and what you thought of it down in the comments below. I look forward to hearing what you all have to say, and I'll be back next week with another review. Thanks for watching.